Welcome to Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone and the Libertarian Institute. Today, I am joined by Scott Hodge, President Emeritus and Senior Policy Advisor at the Tax Foundation. We'll be discussing his book, Taxocracy. Mr. Hodge, thank you so much for your time, sir. Uh, well, it's a delight to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. What is the thesis of your book, Taxocracy? Well, it's really a storybook or a book of stories about the unintended consequences of tax policy, uh, which there are many. <laughs> and, and the lessons, the economic lessons that we can learn from those unintended consequences and how we can create a tax system that avoids as much as possible unintended consequences on both our daily lives but on the broader economy as well. And a lot of that has to do with discovering the principles of good tax policy through what's gone wrong in the past and then creating a tax system that's neutral to our uh, daily decision-making or the broader economy and is really essentially neutral to political influence. And that's ultimately what we want is a, is a tax system that's free of political influence so that we can be free to live our daily lives without that influence. Henry Hazlitt wrote a book titled yeah. Economics in One Lesson, and yeah. he says, the art of economics consists in looking not merely at the immediate, but at the longer effects of any act or policy. It consists in tracing the consequences of that policy, not merely for one group, but for all groups. Using yeah. that reference and frame of mind, please walk us through the untended or secondary consequences of taxing the income of workers. Well, you know, any time that you create uh, disparities between the way that certain things are taxed, whether it's income or, or products um, or land or different types of businesses, you're going to create opportunities for arbitrage, uh, for avoidance, uh, for other sorts of economic consequences that end up being unintended. So, for instance, <laughs> look, uh, recently uh, presidential candidate Donald Trump and uh, uh, Vice President Harris have all said that they don't want to tax tips or the income from tips. Well, guess what? <laughs> Once you do that, you're going to in, increase the uh, uh, incentives for people to collect tips as income because it'll be tax free. And then you'll have people uh, arguing, well, no, no, that wage income was actually tip income and therefore it shouldn't be taxed. And then the guy that's uh, washing dishes or the busboy or the cook has said, hey, wait a minute, why is my salary being taxed, but that waiter's tip income not being taxed? And then you get these kind of uh, uh, consequences as people get upset that one person is not being taxed and the other. And you can see how this sort of log rolling effect can happen. And as a consequence, the, the tax system becomes smaller and smaller as fewer and fewer things are, are taxed. We see these in other things like, oh, how about uh, taxing alcohol or beer? Uh, the differential between the way that certain types of alcoholic beverages are taxed has led to the creation of hard seltzers. You see, hard seltzers are taxed like beer, which is taxed less than hard alcohol. So if you have like a, uh, you know, one of these um, Johnny Walker or, or um, uh, very hard alcohol seltzers, those are taxed at one rate, but hard seltzers are taxed at a lower rate like beer. And so you get manufacturers and people trying to make something look or at least be taxed like the lower tax thing rather than the higher tax thing. Those things have broader impacts on the overall economy and we need to take those into consideration. And that's why we need to have what's called a neutral tax system, one that treats everybody alike uh, rather than creating differences. There is a summary of an essay that I found. I don't want to say who it's by. I don't want to poison the well. I just want to get to this idea, and I want to get uh, your response to it. Because sure. so often, free market advocates are uh, – people frame us as advocating dog-eat-dog -dog competition, and everyone's at each other's throats constantly. Here's a summary of an essay. 
The very fact of government and taxation creates inherent conflict between two great classes, those who pay taxes and those who live off them. The net taxpayers versus the net tax consumers. The bigger government gets, the greater and more intense the conflict between those two social classes. Do you see taxation as something inherently uh, creating conflicts within society, whereas the free market is much more harmonious? I can't get a penny out of your pocket unless you give it to me voluntarily. Yeah, sadly, I, I think that is true. And we have a uh, uh, many people don't realize how progressive our tax system is, how much how great of a share of the income tax burden is borne by upper income people and how much we use our tax system to redistribute income from the top of the income scale to the bottom. And you know we have things like uh, policies like the child tax credit, the earned income tax credit. Now we have all kinds of environmental tax credits that help people lower their incomes. And a lot of this is aimed at this middle class or the lower working class. As a result, we have at least 54 million people every year who pay no income taxes because of these very generous tax uh, credits and deductions that are in the tax code. That's about one in three taxpayers. And that means that the upper income people pay a lot more and their income is then shifted down to lower income people. And I think that the more people you have off the tax rolls, which, you know, as a libertarian, I'm kind of thinking, well, God, it wouldn't be nice not to pay income taxes. But the more disparity you have in the way that people pay taxes, the more opportunities you get for the kind of social conflicts that you're referencing. And I think that there's a danger in that. I think everybody should have, if you're going to have it, let me preface this. If you're going to have a tax system, everyone should have skin in the game. It's kind of an all or nothing deal. And the minute you start excluding people from the income tax system, then you have people who see April 15th as payday and not tax day. And I think that's where you get your, your disparities. And too much of the, the job of the IRS these days is to uh, provide benefits to people through the tax code. And it that's not the role of a tax agency. The tax agency, better or for worse, is to collect taxes. It's not to distribute benefits. But that's the role that the IRS is playing these days. And that's really why it's in such a mess that it is. One of the most amazing myths that I have come across is the, the comfortability with which Democrats will say, we can take a thing and make it free. It doesn't cost anything. <laughs> yeah, they never say this about the military. They say, we spend too much on the military. Right. All right, I'll grant you that. But then they'll say healthcare and schooling can be free. Uh -huh. And by that, they mean give us 20% of your income or we'll put you in jail. How did, uh, how did they eventually come to the point where uh, they could provide something tax some people for it, give other people the yeah. benefit, and call that free. Do you have any recollection in all your years of research how who started this and how this propaganda, th this blatantly obvious propaganda mm -hmm. uh, started and how it's used and how people can see through it? Well, it's probably centuries old, to be quite honest with you, where somebody else's tax payments are used to subsidize something else for another group of people to give the illusion, um, or the mirage, if you will, that something is less costly than it really is. A great example is college tuition these days. For generations, uh, politicians have been trying to make college and university more affordable to people through tax credits or other sorts of subsidies. And guess what? College gets more expensive, not less expensive, because what happens is that the provider of the good can capture those subsidies in the form of higher uh, prices effectively. And as a result, the more you subsidize something, the more they can build into the price and the more that they can capture that and make it more expensive. We see the same thing in housing these days. We have the mortgage interest deduction, which was intended to lower the cost of, of, of housing and make it more affordable. Well, guess what? Economists have found that the mortgage interest deduction gets built into the price of housing, uh, 
making it less affordable, especially in high cost areas or in urban areas like Washington, D.C. or New York or Chicago or L.A., where there's a lot of competition. As a result, the seller of the good can build the, the, that tax subsidy into the price and benefit from that, making it less affordable for lower income people to try to achieve that. We're seeing the same thing in now in automobiles where all of these subsidies for electric cars and other things, the more that government tries to make something more affordable, the more expensive it becomes. Um, <laughs> the great satirist and, and, and humor writer P.J. O'Rourke many years ago made this comment about uh, the Clinton administration's efforts to nationalize health care. He said, you think health care is expensive now? Wait till it's free. And that's essentially what captures, I think, the idea of this moral hazard of trying to subsidize things and then end up uh, the seller of the good captures that subsidy and makes it more expensive. And even if, let's say it was free, or I, I'm not even going to say that, let's say it's much <laughs> less monetarily costly than could be provided in the voluntary sector. The service is so horrible. I had to get a 911 call from the Arizona Police Department, mm. and they said, all right, it's going to be about four, uh, 10 business days. And I go, getting an audio file, sending it to my email. All right, there you go. But it's really cheap. It's only five bucks. I go, well, <laughs> the Libertarian Institute gives away thousands of hours of audio for free on demand. Whatever. Take your time. I called on the 11th business day and I said, hello, it's been 11 days now. You promised 10. Where is it? And they said, actually, uh, as of now, there's quite a few uh, people who are in the queue. It's going to be about five months. So for my legal trial, I did not have the 911 call in question because it takes five months yeah. and they have the nerve to brag that, well, it's really cheap. But we see this. I'm reading about Lyndon Johnson's administration. Now, mm. we were told that there's going to be three groups of people. If you can afford health care, uh, you're too old to work, so and you're very high risk, so you'll get Medicare. Mm -hmm. And then if you're poor, you'll get Medicaid. So everyone's covered under the Great Society plan. Walk us through a causal connection between the state subsidizing health care and an increase in health care costs. Because we could immediately see, well, since the Great Society, since even the Affordable Care Act and FDA expansion, health care's gotten more expensive, to which they'll say, Thank heavens there was intervention, or it'd be even more expensive mm -hmm. than it was now. Walk us through the causal connection between healthcare specifically, how subsidizing and regulation increase the cost of healthcare. The true free market in healthcare was broken down actually in World War II. And it was during a time in which the government was imposing wage and price controls uh, during a time of inflation during the war. Well, labor unions got upset because they weren't getting pay increases. And so they went to the administration, FDR, and they said, hey, you know, is there another way in which we can get income, if you will, or benefits, which um, employers were trying to use uh, in order to try to entice workers by offering them, you know, uh, benefits such as health care or retirement. Um, and the question was, do you tax those things or not as income? Well, the decision was, we're not going to tax health care insurance uh, or retirement insurance as benefits. And the die was cast. And by shifting the, that income to employers where it's deductible and, and not taxable to, to, to employees, you get a situation where you have all this income that's essentially outside of the tax code. You also have a, a breakdown in market dynamics because no longer is the patient the real customer of health care. It's the employer or the insurance company. And so the market then tends to respond to what the employer or the insurance company demands, not what the consumer or the patient demands. And you get this breakdown. The other thing that happens is you get the illusion as a, as a customer or as a patient that health care is relatively free because that other guy, my, my, pay, uh, my uh, employer, is paying the bills. So I can use as much as I possibly want. 
because someone else is paying it. This third party payer program also breaks down those market forces that would normally uh, 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 create the competitive uh, environment to, to reduce costs. And so this whole market in healthcare has been broken down by both not taxing these things as benefits, but also this third party payer problem, which the real customers, I liken it in the book to, uh, to, uh, uh, veterinary medicine where the patient, which is actually the pet, is brought in, but the owner and the doctor negotiate over the quality and the amount of care. So the patient really has nothing to do with it. It's just sitting there helplessly. And we have that situation uh, as patients. So what we need to do is bring more market forces into the healthcare system so that we are no longer like pets. We're real, we're real patients and we're real customers. It's just so obvious that they restrict supply actively with regulations yep. and then they subsidize demand, which lowers the supply even more. Have you ever heard? Can't make it up. Oh, but by the way, I lured Mr. Hodge here under the guise of we're going to talk about the Kamala Harris speech, which I promise we will get to. But there's just <laughs> a few more things just because I'm so furious over this issue. Have you ever heard a real progressive steel man for the case of? Uh, their economic theory explaining why computers and televisions have drastically decreased in price, price and increased in quality. Because the reason they say for healthcare is so expensive is because it's privatized and housing mm. is privatized. And well, computers and televisions are privatized as if they're right. taken out of the state of nature and then privatized. <laughs> That's another fake word they use. Right. Um, do they have any explanation for how? Free market products decrease in cost and increase in quality? No, obviously they have the entire mechanism backwards. You know, a good example that I bring up in the book is, is eyeglasses. And in my neighborhood here in Washington, D.C., near my office, uh, there are as many eyeglasses retailers as there are Starbucks, uh, which is like two on every block, and which tells you that people need eyeglasses as much as they need lattes. But the real thing is in eyeglasses, there's much more of a marketplace. And so there's a lot more competition. Uh, the place across the street offers two for one. The place down the on the other uh, end of the corner has another deal going. Uh, there's a, an, another one around the street uh, that will send you five free glasses to try on. And this is the kind of competition that we get in eyeglasses that we don't see in other areas of the medical ma um, marketplace. And it's all because in one area, you have much more of a free market at operation and competition. And the other one, you have this quasi mercantilist um, government controlled market that in which the market forces have been completely broken down. Are you familiar with, uh, so one thing we can do is look at heavily regulated industries versus less yep. regulated industries in order to get an idea of what is going down in cost. Are you familiar with looking inside of one industry where there's more and less regulations in certain areas? The example that was used by Joe Jorgensen, the uh, former libertarian presidential candidate, is LASIK eye surgery mm. has drastically decreased in cost and yep. increased in quality. And yes. insurance companies uh, don't cover it, and the state isn't jumping uh, at uh, something like this, demanding it be a right that everyone have when it uh, first uh, c came on the market. Do you have any examples of things within the same industry that are more and less heavily regulated and how the price was affected for the consumer? Well, that's that's a, a great example, obviously. And, you know, we see it in, in other areas. Um, you know, I, I, I was in the education field, Look at the ways in which the market is trying to get into education to make it more affordable to people. Uh, you know, Sylvan Learning Centers, Encyclopedia Britannica, these sort of supplementary education opportunities uh, for people. Uh, you know, you'd like to see the same thing in charter schools where, you know, at least some le me measure of a market um, uh, uh, opportunity is there for people to avoid going into the public education. So I think you get this thing in fits and spurts. You used to see these things, oh, probably a very good example of that um, is um, 
is Uber and um, uh, and other sort of ride share operations where we used to have very, very regulated taxi cab uh, markets here in, in major urban areas. Well, Uber and other things came in and said, we're going to break that down and use the market to fill in real needs for people who need to get from, from here to there, from home to work and so forth. And so the market can provide those kinds of opportunities when given the chance to break down those otherwise monopolistic or government enforced uh, uh, um, markets. That is such a great point of optimism. I remember reading a book by Walter Williams titled Race and Economics, and he just makes the bulletproof case against the New York City taxi cab medallion licenses mm -hmm. that the taxis have to get. He goes, it was $5,000, then $50,000 today. Yeah. It's up to like a million dollars. And this was in 2008. And he goes, so we're going to have to work on repealing this. And unfortunately, you didn't get some full repeal. But what you got instead were market alternatives. So there's still uh, areas for us to be uh, very optimistic about. Yeah, on, as far on, as that, on that point, I want to I want to endorse um, another book that is the reason that I am in the business I am. In the late 1970s, Bob Poole, who was the founder of the Reason Foundation, wrote a little book called Cutting Back City Hall. And it was full, it, like my, my book, it was full of little anecdotes and stories about how markets were used to solve local government problems, whether it was privatization, competition, uh, vouchers, other kinds of things like that in which market forces can solve local problems. And for me, as a young person discovering free market economics, it was a revelation because it made the free market real and tangible. It was no longer theories. It was no longer supply and demand curves. It was reality. And I think that for those of us who espouse free markets and libertarian principles, those kinds of examples really ought to be the heart and soul of our arguments because they, they prove that markets can work and solve problems. And that's what we're trying to do. I was just thinking, as you had mentioned, uh, the uh, market going into the education sector. Are you familiar with places like LearnLiberty.org, Khan Academy, Internet yes. Archive, the Libertarian Institute, Wikipedia.com? Awesome. All these places provide a low cost online education. Of course, yeah. you got to pay for the opportunity cost to get a computer. But then again, when I was in college, we were all expected to have computers. Uh, and textbooks in college were, let's just say, not free. Uh, as far as uh, as far as things, I was paying two hundred dollars for a textbook. I just lied and said, "Yeah, I bought it." I found a free PDF on libgen.is of all the college textbooks. Just just so infuriating. Um, okay, well, one <laughs> and, and more you, thing. And you, were, and you weren't paying for climbing walls and gold plated cafeterias and all the other things that come to going to you know big universities today. I was paying for them indirectly, but the worst price I had to pay was the opportunity cost of the year and a half before they actually kicked me out, wasting my time with the Pythagorean theorem. Right. Um, <laughs> all right. So we have somewhat of a dichotomy. Uh, vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance says, what we need to do is tax things that we want to disincentivize. And I go, well, this is interesting. Yeah. And he says, you know, th these behaviors that are, you know, uh, uncivilized and unproductive, we should tax them. All right, that's one thing. But then he doesn't say we're going to stop taxing income. It seems like they blatantly understand that taxing income disincentivizes work, makes us less productive. How do they square this circle where on one sense they say we have to tax everything and the reason we tax things is only because they're bad? What, what uh, I, I get that there's not much of a question there, and I'm really just ranting because yeah, I'm furious no, no, no. that v Vance knows better than this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, I mean, you, you hit on an essential point here is the disconnect between people who advocate things like sin taxes, where we're going to use tax policy to get rid of socially undesirable things like cigarettes or alcohol or gambling or pollution. And so we're going to use those taxes because we know that if you tax something, you get less of it. You disincentivize the use of something. Well, they understand that principle when it comes to things like socially undesirable things. But now they've made wealth and success 
and income socially undesirable. Those things are now, you know, wealth taxes are the new sin taxes. Because progressives and liberals, and to be honest with you, even some conservatives these days, see businesses, see wealthy people as socially undesirable, and so they want to tax them. Um, I call these success taxes, where they're taxes on, on successful people, on successful businesses, on successful entrepreneurial activity, and we are going to stop them. The strange thing about this is the inherent contradiction. Are these taxes there to raise revenues or stop the behavior? Now, if you tax cigarettes and try to use those revenues to pay for child care, eventually, <laughs> if you've done, if the taxes have worked, there's no revenues to pay for child care, right? So if you've taxed wealth in order to redistribute it to other people to raise their standard of living or lower their costs, well, eventually you run out of someone else's revenues in order to do that. So they haven't solved this riddle because they're trying to have it both ways. They want the trillions of dollars that Elizabeth Warren says will come from a wealth tax, and she wants to use it to pay for whatever, universal health care or something else. Well, you can't have it both ways. You can't kill the goose and expect the golden eggs, right? So you're either trying to just wound the goose so that it still produces the golden eggs and then use that as a political metaphor or something else uh, for your own purposes. So Elizabeth Warren called it the two cent tax. No. Another <laughs> lie. What she meant is a two percent tax. Right. Now, right. As if she wanted two pennies extra from everyone. The government, I think the 2023 numbers were $6.27 trillion they spent, and they literally have the nerve. I mean, they must hate the population so much that they think the only reason they would actually say something like this seriously to us is if they thought we were complete idiots. Almost as bad as when Barack Obama said, women earn 70 cents on the dollar for every dollar a man makes. Anyone, right. if you expect me to believe such obvious nonsense, you must have such contempt for me. You just think I'm such a moron. Uh, it's amazing. And they say that, well, we have to have an education system so we have an educated society. You think the society's so full of idiots, they believe stuff like more government funding is going to solve okay. government issues, which the state yeah. created in the first place. Well, I, you know, sadly, I, I think that economic literacy and tax literacy is very poor in the United States and we, we don't teach it to people. And so they end up being illiterate. And, and, and you know, I, I don't blame, I don't want to blame people for being economically illiterate. Um, it, the tax system is very complicated. I have a story at the beginning in the introduction of my book in that in taxocracy that for once Congress did the right thing a few years ago by eliminating a tax deduction, a $4,000 tax deduction for education expenses. And why? People were confused by it. They were taking this $4,000 deduction rather than a $2,000 tax credit. Now, deductions lower your taxable income, whereas credits lower your tax payments dollar for dollar. So for most people, a tax credit is much more valuable than a tax deduction. So the inherent complexities of the tax system are, are, it's understandable that they're confusing to people. And so they are easily bamboozled because of the complexity of the tax system. And then these rationales we hear by politicians that the rich aren't paying their fair share and yada, yada. What they're doing is they're playing on people's ignorance or their lack of tax literacy. And it's quite understandable that most people who don't dig into the tax code like you and I would um, are easily fooled by this kind of rhetoric. How many pages are in the federal tax code? Do you have any idea? <laughs> I, 
I don't know. Yeah, I, I've heard everything from 70,000 to 100,000. And I think it depends on the font size and the paper size and whether you're including, you know, all of the, 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 the decisions and other paperwork that goes with it. But you know, I wrote a recent paper, uh, which is on the Tax Foundation's website, about the compliance costs of the tax system. And Americans spend over... <laughs> 8 billion hours a year complying with the tax system at a total cost of over $500 billion when you include both our time and then the out-of-pocket costs that it takes to comply with the tax code. The sad thing is that, well, two things. One is that time is not time that we can't get back, you know. Um, it, it, it's the time and money that we've invested on behalf of the government rather than ourselves. But also a lot of those expenses are borne by businesses because they're both paying taxes, but also uh, remitting taxes on our behalf, like, in, um, uh, like withholding taxes and sales taxes and things like that. So a lot of the, the cost of, of the tax code really falls on businesses. And that's one of the reasons why their costs go up and you know, they're paying more for accountants than they are for engineers. And that's just not right. Of course. And as bad as it is for the Amazons and Walmarts of the world to have to comply, they're able to do it at relatively low cost, but they're upstarts and their competitors. It right. is extremely difficult. This creates the very oligopolies the progressives pretend to be protecting us from. Yeah. Um, Okay, I got to start with my own questions, and we have to get to <laughs> Vice President Harris. I'm going to read okay. something to eat. Comment. Let me know what you think. Okay. Vice President Harris says, but America, we are not going back. We are not going back to when Donald Trump tried to cut Social Security and Medicare. Did that ever happen? Uh, no, I can't think of when that happened during the Trump administration, frankly, uh, or has happened in recent memory, uh, to be honest with you. So, uh, yeah, that's, I, again, that's you know, a lot of this is, it's, it's, yeah, it's hyperbole and political rhetoric. Um, here's the problem though, that both candidates are not addressing. And that is social security and Medicare are effectively bankrupt today, meaning more expenditures are going out for those two programs than the tax revenues that are needed to pay for them. But the trust funds that are meant to be stored up and spent down now are essentially going bankrupt and will go bankrupt in the next 10 years. Neither politician, uh, Trump or Harris, are addressing what to do about those consequences. They seem to be pushing them off on some future Congress or politicians. And that's a shame because those two programs are driving our deficits and debt. And unless we address them and understand the long-term liabilities and address those, uh, the long-term effect on, on taxpayers will be enormous. But the effect would not be necessarily like me going into personal debt. They would just pay it by increasing the money supply, which would lower no. the value. Is that not accurate? Well, there that they two. would pay it off by printing more money, increasing the money supply, devaluing the dollars that are currently in circulation in the economy, and leading to further inflation. Well, there, there, there are really three ways in which you can you can fund something. You can reduce the cost of that, or you can you know reduce the benefits eventually. Which, if you don't address the expiration of those trust funds, then that's going to happen. Uh, benefits will have to be slashed by twenty or thirty percent. Or you can raise taxes on current workers to pay for them, which is what happened in 1983 when Social Security was going bankrupt uh, 40 years ago. They just raised the payroll tax and they adjusted a few things with some of the benefits and they solved the problem, they said, at least for another 40 years. Well, that problem is coming back to haunt us. Or you can do what we're doing today and you can borrow more, more money. Either way, there are political consequences and tax and politicians want to avoid those. So they do nothing. And the result is by doing nothing, you end up just borrowing more money. Um, but the real solution li lies in, in real fundamental reform, such as privatization of social security or personal investment accounts, 
um, moving toward market solutions for Medicare. Those are real options that are being avoided today because of political fear. The vice president continues, we are not going to let him eliminate the Department of Education that funds our public schools. We are not going to let him end programs like Head Start that provide preschool and child care. <laughs> Have you heard President Trump uh, prioritize that? I know he didn't do any of that in his first four years. No, as far as I know, that that's not been on the agenda. But what they're pointing to is a, a, a policy uh, book or or program that was put together by the Heritage Foundation and others uh, that has lots of policy prescriptions in it. And I have to admit that uh, 30 years ago, I was part of a large group of people calling for the elimination of the Department of Education because it really doesn't do anything but launder money through a huge bureaucracy before giving it out to state and local governments. And it makes a mess of things as a result. So why do we have the Department of Education? Well, uh, it was given to us by Jimmy Carter in the late 1970s. And, um, you know, I, I, all education is local. And besides of which, we need more market. We need more private alternatives to education, not more government. And so, well, you know, she's trying to, to, to raise fears about the Department of Education. The honest truth is most our education is local. It should be privatized. It should be, you should have market competition. You should allow, look, I live in Washington, D.C., where half the kids that go to school here don't graduate. And that's the real problem here is we've, we, we've, we've stuck kids, these poor kids into poor schools, which gives them no opportunities to get out. That's what the Department of Education does. You know, it creates these islands of lack of opportunity that's the real tragedy. So, I mean, I think that this is all political rhetoric. And if you get right down to it and explain to people, we want to give poor kids real opportunities. I think that that's a winning message. Certainly. And the, uh, the, the explicit lies that the uh, Department of Education is responsible for spreading. I always thought what made America unique was the invention of slavery by someone either like Thomas Jefferson or maybe the, the, the most uh, 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 worldwide view you'd get is actually slavery goes back to 1916 in America. So you'll be surprised when I came across the Code of Hammurabi talking about slavery <laughs> thousands of years on a different continent. They tell us about the food pyramid, which makes kids totally obese, telling them to eat bread and pasta as their primary servings. Department of Education. So she's just lying about that. He doesn't really plan on cutting that. Didn't for his first four years. Although I wish he really would. She goes yeah, on to say. I, yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, I tell you what, every, every morning I drive to work and I pass the NEA building, the, the union of, of te teachers union building. It's enormous. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Wait a minute. Why it, should a teacher's union have such a large building of their own? What are they doing? You know, it's it, they're just they're busy serving the public. L leave them alone. S s make sure you're nice to them. See, in the free market, people are looking after profit. They just want money. All the people in that building are unpaid volunteers yeah. just worrying about the public good. That's right. Vice president continues. Um, because we know a strong middle class has always been critical to America's success. And building that middle class will be a defining goal of my presidency. Yeah. So with this one, let's just take her at her word. We both want a strong middle class. I don't know why they focus on the middle and not the poorest, most vulnerable. I guess just because there's more people who consider themselves middle class. And that's how she gets the votes. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Say I want a strong middle class. What tax policies should I embrace or support? <laughs> well, uh, gosh, there's so many elements to this, quite honestly. And of course, politicians for, for generations have talked about trying to help the middle class. And as you mentioned, everybody thinks they're in the middle class. To be honest with you, the middle class is a value system. It's not a point on the income scale. And so, you know, we play into this notion we're going to help the middle class. Um, and that's essentially people in the sort of statistical middle Um but nonetheless, what we've tried, what politicians have tried to do over the last few decades is lard on to uh, the tax system, you know, things like the child tax credit, the earned income tax credit, housing credits, 
um, uh, you know, solar panel credits and all these other things. They're supposed to help the cla uh, middle class and lower their tax bill. And what they've done is just turn the IRS into a, a, a benefits agency. But the real problem here, if you listen to that rhetoric, and that's only part of it because there's there's other speeches in which she and other surrogates have essentially said, we're going to give tax benefits to the, quote, middle class and make the rich pay their fair share. So what's the message here? It's that being middle class is valuable, it's, it's worthy, but being rich is not. It's sinful. So it's no good deed comes, goes unpunished. So if you stay middle class, then, you know, that's that's a good trait to have. But if you have the God-given talents or resources or, or um, uh, incentives or entrepreneurship to become successful, we're going to tax the hell out of you and punish you for that for doing that. That's essentially no good deed goes unpunished economics. And, well, and, and that... That's punishing the very values that we should be encouraging. Entrepreneurship, success, hard work, God-given talents, all of those things. And set, instead, this is a value system that says, stay middle class, don't be successful. They don't even differentiate between people who gain wealth as a causal result of meeting consumer demand and people who get it through extortion or tariffs or something like that. So right. in her worldview, a bank robber and Steve Jobs both have a lot of money and therefore they're they're the wealthy and they're bad. Steve Jobs gives us the iPhone and the Mac and the other one is a parasite. So they just vilify they're the actual classists that they call us in every single case. Right. And look at the ways in which they do try to help the poor through the tax system. Uh, Low-income housing tax credits, this multi-billion-dollar boondoggle, in which we essentially give tax incentives to rich developers to help poor people with low-income housing. Well, who benefits from that, really? It's the rich developers. We have other things like opportunity credits or the opportunity zones and in, in, in enterprise zones, which many of us in the free market had advocated. Well. All we need to do is lower taxes in these poor areas, and it's going to cause this, this renaissance of investment. Well, what it's done is actually benefit rich developers uh, and, and investors and not the poor people that are in these, these, these poor areas. And so we got the incentives all backwards. And even those of us in the free market movement who have advocated things like this end up getting it wrong because we, we don't understand where the incentives really are and who really benefits from these things. And so these place-based incentive programs benefit the rich and not the poor people who live in those poor areas. Kamala Harris goes on, says, that's why we will create what I call an opportunity economy. So yeah. let's just accept her uh, verdict here and say, we too want an opportunity economy, which we do. we do. What policies should we embrace if we want an opportunity economy? Well, you, you need lower taxes on capital, uh, whether that's lower uh, uh, corporate taxes, lower taxes on entrepreneurs, lower taxes on incentives, uh, not double taxing, savings and investment. And then ultimately, um, you need tax reform that takes the politics out of the tax system, that doesn't double tax um, uh, investment income or savings, and essentially a tax system that doesn't punish success and gets out of the way of people who want to be entrepreneurial and who, who are uh, interested in, in creating a better life for themselves rather than being punished when they try to... Um, to advance their own uh, uh, standard of living. One of the great lessons I learned uh, studying economics is, again, back to Hazlitt's uh, original quote there, is that even if we just punish those evil, greedy bastards who are wealthy, <laughs> well, if we stop Amazon, you just nationalize Amazon tomorrow, well, 
yeah, I'm sure Jeff Bezos will be hurt, but you're also restricting the amount of products and services that the average person has access to. That makes the poor and middle class worse off than they otherwise would have been. If you nationalized Apple, the same thing would happen. More regulations mean fewer employment opportunities because there's fewer businesses to choose from of where to work. So that lowers the amount of leverage the average worker has. It restricts the number of products and services you can buy. It's just completely ridiculous. And they brag about how they're always helping us. Well, imagine a world without billionaires. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like no, it, like the year 1000 when everyone was rich. <laughs> 1000 AD, no billionaires. We all no must have lived in abundance. Right. Well, there were always rich people then, but they were they were the kings and people that that that, you know, that impoverished other people at their benefit. Uh, but in a free market, imagine a world without benefits. You would have no Microsoft. We would not be talking on Zoom today or or other sorts of of, of technological inventions that have made people rich so that you and I can have a much better life. There's, there's an odd psychology here on the left and now a growing on the right, and that is zero-sum economics. Now, I have never felt like Bezos or or the wealth generated by Bill Gates or or others have made me poorer. Their wealth or their their billions have not come at my expense. But there are lots of people, especially those on the left, who do believe that we have a zero sum economy. That their wealth somehow did come at our expense, <laughs> despite the benefits of, of all of this wonderful technology. You know, I remember when there was a couple of years ago when you had these people protesting down here on the mall against rich people, and they were on their, their iPads tweeting out uh, screeds against wealth on products made by Steve Jobs. And I'd, I'd walk up to the, and then they'd go over to Starbucks to plug in their iPhones and recharge them. I think, do you understand? The contradiction here <laughs> that you're, you know, the the very things that you're using to spout off your ideology are the very things that made that guy rich. And I don't understand it, but you know, I'm a simple guy. The zero sum economics fallacy. I need yeah. to spend more time on that. That is a very good point. All right, last portion from this because she mentions the word tax five times, and oh, th yeah. this will be the the fifth time. He, Donald Trump, doesn't actually fight for the middle class. Instead, he fights for himself and his billionaire friends. He will give them another round of tax breaks that will add $5 trillion to the national debt, all while he intends to enact what, in effect, is a national sales tax. Call it a Trump tax. That would raise prices on middle class families by almost $4,000 a year. Well, instead of a Trump tax hike, we will pass a middle class tax cut that will benefit more than 100 million Americans. I've never heard about the Trump national sales tax, but I have heard of his tariffs, which are effectively just as bad, and yeah. a sales tax. Anything on that final statement? Well, you'd have to separate out these two arguments. One is all about the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, much of which expires next year, at the end of next year. Uh, most of the ben or the uh, uh, tax cuts that 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 were afforded to individuals will expire. So if if Congress does nothing, then the child tax credit will go from two thousand dollars to one thousand dollars. Most tax rates will go up. Um, other uh, tax benefits which people tend to to uh, enjoy today will change. It will be a massive tax increase on the American people of over three trillion dollars. That's by doing nothing. They're calling that, because if you extend that, they're calling that a tax cut for the rich. And so it's a matter of perspective here in Washington. <laughs> We're <laughs> allowing current tax policy to extend is somehow a tax cut for the rich. But anyway, I digress. The other part of that, and this is the problem, and she does point to this, this Trump sales tax, is the tariff policy. And that's his 10% across the board tariff on all imported goods which would amount to, yes, a 10% increase 
in the price of all imported goods because that's what tariffs are supposed to do. Now, economists say this is terrible policy, but tariffs are supposed to raise the price of goods. And we saw this during the first Trump administration where he did raise tariffs on things like washing machines and so forth. The price of those did go up. And guess what? Domestic producers also raised their prices to match the price of the imported good. So <laughs> in our attempts to make domestic providers more competitive, we raise the price on consumers by an equal amount. Does that make sense to anyone? No, but well, it does to Trump and his, his followers. It's terrible tax policy. It's terrible economic policy. And ultimately what happens is that our competitors abroad turn around and say, well, you're going to tax us by 10%. We're going to tax your products by 10%. And you get into a tariff war, which is no good for anyone. And we've been down that road back in the 1930s. Economists here at the Tax Foundation have done a lot of, we have a very sophisticated macroeconomic tax model. And they've said or found that the Trump tariffs would be so severe economically, it would overshadow and erase the benefits of extending the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. So all the tax cuts that we would extend after next year, those benefits would be washed away by the increase in Trump's tariffs. That's really bad policy. And I don't understand what, what's to be accomplished in that. Well, probably to inflame the passions of the feeble-minded, the job of every politician. <laughs> um, well, but, but, but just like you said, Herbert Hoover got a letter from like 100 economists saying, don't pass this Smoot-Hawley tariff. And he did it anyways, just because they have an yeah. incentive to do something and tell the population, we're working on it. And if something good happens, yeah, you're welcome. If something bad happens, wow, I guess we need to take more money and have more power. <laughs> Well, there's also a real change in attitudes on both parties toward this sort of um, protectionism, uh, mercantilism, and uh, isolationism. And uh, all of those are very, very bad. And we've seen it uh, in the early part of the last century, in the last part of the 1800s, where you get this sort of, well, we're just going to stop companies from doing business abroad because they're obviously shipping jobs abroad and that's terrible. Um, you know, we, we want to um, protect domestic providers from competition from abroad and so forth. And we have this, that mercantilism is a really dangerous thing because we do have a, a growing global economy. We want to be competitive in it. And you can't just make stuff here and put it on a boat and ship it abroad and be competitive. You have to engage in the international economy. And at the same time, we want to create a competitive tax system in the U.S. so that we can attract investment from abroad and that we can make our domestic providers more competitive so that they can do business abroad. All of these things make we, consumers and taxpayers and workers, much better off. We want to have tax policy that raises everybody's standard of living. And the way to do that is to have a competitive tax system that makes the U.S. a good place to do business in and do business uh, from. And that's what we're not getting from either of the presidential candidates right now. There is a uh, series of books written by Winston Churchill. I think it's just titled The Second World War. It's his memoirs. And in the first one, he talks about how when he was first Lord of the Admiralty in the First World War, he said, what we need, to, I, I told Henry Asquith, we need to blockade Germany. Mm. And I go, well, surely this will stimulate German job growth within the domestic industry. And this would make Germany very wealthy. As I've been told from time and memorial that that is what would happen if you yeah. didn't trade, then everyone would get the same things that they have now, but they'd just get them locally. And of course, pro uh, Churchill historian Martin Gilbert's like, yeah, roughly it led to 800,000 German deaths as a cause or result of this blockade because they could not trade freely. That's yeah. what we're actually talking about. It's not some esoteric technical tariff kind of thing. 
we're actually talking about mass death and starvation of the very vulnerable people we're told that the politicians have been sent from heaven to help. A lot of progressives today do not believe in free trade. They don't believe in trade at all. They think trade is bad for domestic workers. And this is the crazy thing for me. They believe that when we trade, especially with developing countries, it is bad for developing countries. That somehow our trade with them disrupts their local markets and hurts their local producers. Anything but the case. Trade lifts both parties up. It makes everybody better off, and, and especially free trade. What we've got now is at best managed trade, which is not great. But this, this, this notion that we should not have any trade because trade is bad. Oh, and trade is bad for the environment, too, um, and somehow causes global warming. I mean, come on. But uh, this is the kind of crazy nut job world that we're in right now. And both parties are really playing into it in so many different ways. Have you ever uh, been thanked for all the taxes you've paid? <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I can't make it a single day in the private sector without being thanked by Starbucks, Planet Fitness, Apple, the people at That's the wonderful. Guitar Center who gave me this microphone. I think taxation, it, when I read this quote by Antonin Scalia, I just, <laughs> just my world froze. He said, the welfare state has created recipients without gratitude and donors without love. And it, it, it was something like that. And recipients <laughs> without wonderful. gratitude, I go, well, isn't this interesting? When I was a child, it was always, that person just helped you out. Say thank you. We are actually generating a culture where people who feel so entitled to your income that they will advocate you be put in jail if you don't give it to them. Yeah. It not only hurts the victim, it even hurts these very people by making them less thankful, less appreciative. The gratitude is the mother of happiness and they have been stripped of all gratitude from their customer base who they pretend to serve. Do you have any comment on that? I just wanted to see if you've ever been thanked because I never have. Uh, no. Instead of being thanked, they just want more. Oh. Um, and, you know, as Margaret Thatcher said of socialists, eventually they run out of other people's money. So uh, that that's really the sad aspect is, no, they're just never, ever satisfied with getting enough because their desires to spend more is infinite and way beyond what the private sector can actually deliver or pay for. And so that's why we get into these crazy ideas about taxing, um, you know, unrealized capital gains and taxing wealth and taxing other things. It's just this endless desire for more taxes because it pays for their endless desire for more government. I was having a conversation with a friend about what is the purpose of opposing really evil things, kidnapping, murder, slavery. <laughs> theft and robbing because we're never going to have a world without those things. Why oppose them? Right. And th th the answer we came to is it's important for us as rational, sentient human beings to take a stand and really oppose something on principle, even if we think we could only maybe diminish it, but never completely abolish it. When it comes to the concept of taxation, I get to take a percentage of your money under coercion. You do not have the same right to do that to me. Is this something the tax foundation would be willing to embrace to oppose taxation on principle and say, and the state can have as much money as it wants. It just has to get it through the same voluntary, peaceful win-win trade mechanisms that the rest of us do. Is this something well, uh, the tax foundation would consider? We really stand for principled tax policy, economically principled tax policy, P policy that does the least amount of harm uh, to individuals and businesses in the economy, um, a tax policy that um, doesn't distort or change our behavior or force us to think about taxes and how they're going to change our, our 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 daily lives. I mean, that's that's really what we should be looking for. At, at, at in the conclusion of my book, Taxocracy, I talk about free will and how so much tax policy you know is really anti-free will 
because it's really forcing us to do things that politicians want us to do, not what we want to do. In, in order to go through our daily lives and think about, oh, well, I've got to buy a house. Gee, do I get a tax deduction for that? I want to buy a car. Oh, do I, gee, do I get a tax deduction for that? Uh, oh, solar panel on the house, uh, et cetera. Et cetera. Oh, kid, put my kid in daycare. Go to college. Do I get a tax credit for that? All of these things are affecting our daily. It's affecting our free will. So we want a tax system that is compatible with free will, and that means a tax system that's neutral. It's economically neutral and it's politically neutral and doesn't impact our daily lives and decision making. The book is Taxocracy, What You Don't Know About Taxes and How They Rule Your Daily Life. Mr. Hodge, where is the best place for people to find this book? Anywhere online, uh, any of the major sellers, uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, even Target has it online. And uh, thank you. I, I hope that it's an enjoyable read for everyone. It's free of jargon. It's full of lots of stories that I think are memorable, but also teaching moments uh, that can help us understand uh, how we can take a stand for economically principled tax policy and tax reform. I want to end on what I believe is the most pathetic piece of propaganda I have ever come across. This wow, is okay, how <laughs> the income tax was introduced and popularized among the American public. I paid my income tax today. I'm only one of millions more whose income never was taxed before. A tax I'm very glad to pay. I'm squared up with the USA. You see those bombers in the sky. Rockefeller helped to build them, so did I. I, I can't get through all 40 seconds. <laughs> oh, I've that's, tried. That's priceless. That must have been during the early part of World War II uh, when we went from having a tax on, on largely wealthy people to having a max, mass income tax in which everyone then was brought into the tax system. <laughs> but I have not heard that before, and that's priceless. The book is Taxocracy, which you don't know about taxes and how they rule your daily life. Thanks to everyone for watching Keith Knight Don't Tread on Anyone in the Libertarian Institute. Mr. Hodge, thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you. It's been a delight and a pleasure. And I, I hope your listeners take away some lessons from this and, and really enjoy it.